please um, now join uh, Darren Grover from the World Wild Fund for Nature, and he's just about to give us his discussion on uh, Black Summers. Over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. And uh, it, it is rather odd that I'm here to talk about fire when this event is um, about water. But one of the things that we learnt during Black Summer was it wasn't just about trees and wildlife, that these fires of unprecedented scale and intensity also had significant impacts on aquatic, ecos aquatic ecosystems, water quality and water supplies. However, we don't really understand too much what effect fires do have on aquatic biodiversity. Uh, we don't know how fire will impact on water quality and over what time. And we're certainly only now discovering the impact of fires, especially on water supplies for rural communities. So what, we, what I would like to talk about today in, in my seven minutes is you know, the support that we need to get a better understanding of the impact of fires, especially fires of the type, of the, of the intensity that we've seen throughout the Black Summer, and how innovation can help us to better understand and better prepare and respond to bushfires and their impacts that they have on our aquatic systems. So WF Australia, we have responded and we responded quickly uh, to the impacts of these fires. I think it's fair to say that we're all, we were stunned and feeling um, somewhat helpless uh, in the face of these fires, but we've been able to hit the ground. We've uh, funded 64 bushfire response projects. Uh, at this stage, very much emergency response uh, type projects, uh, emergency food drops, um, providing food to uh, isolated populations of animals, uh, supporting our wildlife carers, wildlife hospitals, rapid assessments of impacts on, on key species and, and ecosystems, and also providing specialised equipment and technology. Uh, the next phase of our bushfire response is, is kicking off and it will be more about restoration and recovery. It'll mean fewer projects, uh, more funds and greater impact. So we're, we're seeking partners to join us on the front line as we save wildlife, as we restore what was lost and protect and future-proof Australia. We've established a bushfire fund to help us carry out these activities to provide this support I've already talked about the initial phases was emergency response. We're now moving into restoration and recovery and underpinning all that we do is future proofing about reducing the impacts of future fires and uh, responding more effectively. So WWF, uh, we have been globally, we've been around for, for more than 50 years. We have a long and proud history. Uh, we work in over 100 countries. We have the help of over 5 million supporters. And we work to create a world where people live in harmony with nature. So we do have incredible outreach. We can have incredible impact. But much of what we do, we have to do with partners. And I'll touch on partners shortly. Just some of the things that we have achieved in, in recent times. Earth Hour, which is now a global event. Uh, right around the world, in hundreds of countries, thousands of cities, we celebrate Earth Hour, uh, where we turn the lights off for an hour and make a stand against climate change. Well, that all began in 2007 here in Australia, in Sydney. Uh, some of the other things that we've uh, been able to do uh, with support from the WA government, uh, sorry, the Western Australian government, I should say, and our supporters, we built a five kilometre predator proof fence in, in Western Australia around a nature reserve to save an endangered population of rock wallabies, uh, a population that would have become extinct. Uh, in 2015, we secured a ban on dumping in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, and that sounds odd, but certainly at the time, millions of cubic metres of dredge spoil was being dumped into the reef's waters, and we've been able to secure a ban on that. So when we, when we work together with our partners, uh, we're focused, and we can have significant impact. But as I was saying, we can't do these things on our own. We work with governments, we work with businesses, we work with communities, individuals, and we seek to address a range of pressing environmental issues. Our work is founded on science. It underpins all that we do. Our reach is international and our vision is clear. 
but it's a big task and we can't do these things on our own. So we seek partners to help us, uh, but we do know that while we can't address and answer these problems on our own, we know that working together that we can. And you might see there just some of the, some of the different partners that we, we are currently working with. So what I want to talk to you about today and seek your help is in, in two phases. One is how can we reduce the impact of fires on aquatic, on aquatic ecosystems? So how can we prepare? We know these fires are coming. Sadly, climate change scenarios are predicting more fires of the type that we have just seen through the black summer. So can we work with our indigenous communities, with our traditional owners, to help deploy cultural burns at a scale that will reduce the intensity of future fires in those riparian areas, in those areas along our waterways. At the moment, we are deploying between half a million and a million dollars a year from our own funds, but we want to seek partners who can help to contribute to that. Match what we're putting forward so we can have more cultural burning by indigenous communities at scale. And it's also responding after fires, and this is where rather than funding, the support that we are after are ideas and innovation to limit the amount and spread of ash in our waterways. We know that these fires will happen. We know that the ash, which is the trees and the plants and the animals that have been burnt, will ultimately end up in our waterways, either directly or indirectly after rain uh, post-fire. So how can we limit that? Is there a way to buffer our waterways and our streams so much of that ash is captured before it enters our waterways? And also understanding what happens when, the, when that ash enters our waterways? Is there ways then to limit or reduce the impact it has? Can we put in booms or other equipment that prevents the spread? Is there a role for things like flocculants which can drop that ash to, to, the, to the bottom of those waterways? Does that have an impact? So it's a space that we really don't understand what happens and what impact it has. And that's where we really want to tap into the ideas and innovation of you all over these next two or three days. So that's where I'll finish up. Um, it's a big challenge and it's a challenge that's coming at us head on. As I said, there's going to be more fires. We know that. We know the level of impact that they can have, but can we reduce that impact? Can we be better prepared? So there are my contact details. Uh, there's my email. Certainly feel free to get in touch if you do have one of these bright sparks, one of these ideas that we're seeking. And if you're seeking to support, especially our traditional owners, our indigenous communities, help them to get back out on country, uh, reinstate their burning practices, I'm all ears. So thank you very much. Thank you, Darren.